Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 90 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. I hope you're ready because we have an exciting journey to make today. We're making our first trip to Latin and South America. The early American histories of Latin and South America are fascinating. And today, we're going to explore how colonies in these regions waged revolutions and wars for independence throughout the early and mid 19th century. As these other Americans looked to achieve independence from Spain, and in the case of Brazil, Portugal, they turned to the United States for assistance. But how did Americans in the United States view Spanish and Portuguese Americans and their fights for independence? Caitlin Fitz, an assistant professor of history at Northwestern University and author of Our Sister Republics, The United States in an Age of American Revolutions, will help us investigate answers to these very questions. During our conversation, Caitlin reveals what she means by the age of American revolutions, why Spanish and Portuguese Americans waged revolutions and fought for independence, and how Americans in the United States viewed and reacted to these other American revolutions. But first, are you a member of the Ben Franklin's World listener community on Facebook? That's where I host the book giveaways. And I have to tell you, I need to conduct a book giveaway. Actually, I must conduct a book giveaway because I have a literal tower of books to give away and I need to do this in early August. So you have about two weeks to join the community if you haven't already. And joining is super simple. All you need to do is visit benfranklinsworld.com and click on the orange join now button on the homepage or text BF World 233444. Are you ready for our first journey to Latin and South America? Let's go meet our adventurous guide. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us is an assistant professor of history at Northwestern University. She studies early American history in the hemispheric sense. That is to say she's interested in how early Americans interacted with foreign communities and cultures in both North and South America. Today, she joins us to discuss details from her book, Our Sister Republics, The United States in an Age of American Revolutions. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Caitlin Fitz. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Let's begin today's conversation by chatting a bit about terminology. Many scholars use the term Age of Revolutions to describe the period roughly between 1774 and 1848 because many revolutions took place throughout the world during that period. But Caitlin, you use the term Age of American Revolutions. Would you tell us what you mean by that term and why you use it? I'm using the term American to refer to the whole Western Hemisphere, and I'm talking about the revolutions that rocked the hemisphere from the shot heard around the world in 1775 to the independence of what's now Bolivia in 1825. Because by the United States' 50th year, most of the Western Hemisphere was independent from Europe. That obviously includes the United States. It also includes Haiti, which became independent in 1804. It means the entire Spanish-American mainland in the 1810s and early 1820s. So everything from Mexico and Colombia to Argentina and Chile. And it also includes the entirety of Portuguese Brazil in the early 1820s. So after over 300 years of European colonization in the Americas, it was a big transformation, especially because most of these new nations ended up becoming republics, not monarchies. And what was especially interesting to me as a historian, above all, of the United States, was that people in the early U.S., really did understand their world in that hemispheric way. So they called Latin Americans American revolutionaries. And they talked a lot about how amazing it felt to be living through this inter-American revolutionary age. That's how they understood it. I can't wait to dive into the details of the revolutions that took place in Spanish America and find out how Americans in the United States viewed them. 
But before we dive in, I think we need a bit of a history lesson. Would you provide us with an overview of Latin in South America? How many colonies were in those places? And when did Europeans establish those colonies? The Spanish Empire in the Americas essentially began with Columbus's voyage in 1492, and the Portuguese Empire in the Americas in Brazil began in 1500. What that means is that the Spanish and Portuguese empires in the Americas started about a whole century before the British Empire in the Americas did. And then on the flip side of things, the Spanish and Portuguese empires remained intact in the Americas well into the 19th century, which was longer than British America did. So the Spanish and Portuguese empires in the Western Hemisphere were remarkably long lasting. Now, if you compare the U.S. and Spanish America on the eve of their respective independence wars, the biggest difference was probably their sheer size. The 13 colonies that revolted from Britain in 1775-76 were clustered along the Atlantic seaboard. So they called their Congress a Continental Congress, and they mobilized a Continental Army, but they weren't even close to encompassing the entire continent. I mean, for starters, they couldn't even convince the other British colonies in Canada and the Caribbean to join in, much less the rest of North America. So then if you zoom down to Spanish America for comparison, Spanish America was much bigger than that. In fact, it was about 10 times bigger. It stretched all the way from Texas and Florida to the very southern tip of South America. So it spanned the Andes, it spanned the Amazon. And partly because of that really breathtaking geographic diversity, Spanish America's economies differ dramatically too. So in places like Mexico and Peru, you have economies literally grounded in the mining of gold and silver. In other places, you have plantation agriculture, things like coffee, sugar, cotton. And then in places like Argentina, you had ranching and cowboys trading in hides and so forth. So what that collectively meant was that Spanish Americans had to wage their independence wars on a whole different scale of magnitude than the U.S. did. So if you think about how hard it was for the 13 insurgent colonies to stick together in the American Revolution, and you think of the imposing logistics of mobilizing and supplying an army and coordinating political resistance that people like George Washington faced, and then you multiply that by a factor of 10, that's what Spanish Americans confronted. So people in the early 19th century called the Venezuelan hero and statesman Simón Bolívar the George Washington of South America. And clearly in the United States, that was intended as the highest of possible compliments. But in some ways, you could see the comparison as underestimating Bolívar. Bolívar was famous for crossing the skyscraping Andes Mountains with an entire army, whereas George Washington was in New Jersey, crossing the Delaware River. I mean, needless to say, the Andes Mountains were much bigger than the Delaware River, and as it turns out, even more icy and more slippery. While we're on the subject of famous generals, now seems like a good time to talk about Napoleon. The French Revolution took place between 1789 and 1799. In 1799, Napoleon seized control of France, and his reign had far-reaching implications for both Europe and the Western Hemisphere. Caitlin, would you tell us what role Napoleon played in fomenting revolution in Spanish America? Napoleon was a critical spark in igniting the Spanish-American independence wars, although that wasn't his intent or his goal. What happened is that in 1808, in part of his effort to conquer vast swaths of continental Europe, Napoleon essentially brazenly kidnapped the Spanish royal family. The Spanish royals were a kind of bumbling, quarrelsome bunch, and so Napoleon lured them to France with an offer to help them sort out a dynastic dispute. And then once they're there in France, Napoleon will not let them leave. Instead, he sends his brother, Joseph Bonaparte, to rule as the new king of Spain. And most people in Spain are unhappy about this. And so they take up arms against their would-be king, Joseph Bonaparte, and they fight a catastrophically violent guerrilla war called the Peninsular War, which is a subset of these Napoleonic Wars. And it lasts for about six years. So if you know the Spanish artist, Francisco de Goya, And if you know maybe his 
famous and haunting painting called Executions of the 3rd of May, 1808. That's the Peninsular War that he was chronicling. What then does this have to do with Spanish America? Well, it meant that Spain had a power vacuum. Nobody had control of Spain. And so to make a very long story very short, people in Spanish America started to ask, okay, if there's no acting king, then who is holding our empire together? Are we like planets without a sun, or as one person at the time put it, are we just like bishops without a pope? Where do our loyalties lie? So it still took a long time for that imperial chaos to coalesce into full-fledged independence wars. As with the American Revolution in the 1770s, loyalty to the monarch and loyalty to the empire really died hard. And a lot of people in the Spanish colonies really wanted reform rather than revolution. But for a variety of reasons, independence was the ultimate outcome. It sounds like there were similarities between the American Revolution, which we know was waged over a combination of ideological, economic, social and political reasons, and the Spanish-American Revolutions, which we know started with a political reason, a power vacuum in Spain. Were there other reasons Spanish-Americans fought for their independence? Did they have a variety of economic, social and ideological reasons, too? Absolutely. South Americans acted from a similar mixture and combination of reasons, sometimes contradictory reasons. It depends on the person or the group that you're talking about, just as it did in the United States. So some South Americans were what you might think of as Republican ideologues or kind of Enlightenment thinkers who didn't want to be ruled by European monarchies. Others especially certain merchants, hoped that independence would bring economic gains. So these are people who reasoned that if they cast off Spanish rule, they'd also be casting off Spanish colonial trade restrictions and opening themselves up to new trading partners like the U.S. and especially for a lot of them, Britain. And then other South Americans acted out of pragmatic political calculation. So for one interesting example, in Colombia and Venezuela, men of color very cannily assessed imperial politics and concluded for a variety of reasons that they would have more political power in an independent republic than if they remained in the Spanish empire. So like you said, just as with the American Revolution, there were a huge number of reasons that people started to move towards independence. But then there's this final one, too, which is that the Spanish monarchy kind of fumbles. In 1814, Napoleon fell from power, and the rightful Spanish king, whose name was Fernando VII, or Ferdinand VII, he was restored to the throne. And he kind of had this chance to coax his errant colonies back into the empire. But Fernando VII kind of thought the empire should and could go back to how it had been before Napoleon. He didn't really realize how much had changed, how much Spanish Americans had already sacrificed in war, or how much popular opinion had mobilized, how much traditional hierarchies had already started to break down. So starting in 1815, Fernando VII launched a counter-revolutionary campaign. He sent over 10,000 soldiers across the Atlantic to try to recolonize Spanish America, but it turned out to be just as brutal, just as violent as the fighting in Napoleonic Spain had been. And it ultimately only turned Spanish Americans even more strongly against the crown than before. So the independence wars continued to rage for another decade through 1825. Let's travel back in time. Let's go to, say, a year before the Haitian Revolution, which puts us in 1790. Before the age of American revolutions reached Spanish America, how did Americans view Spanish Americans and their colonies? Before the Latin American independence movements, people in the U.S. didn't know a whole lot about Latin America. What they did know, or what they thought they knew anyway, was often just a blend of stereotypical stock images. So if you look at early U.S. geography textbooks, they would talk about greedy conquistadors and licentious Catholic priests. So this is what historians now call the black legend, which is just the idea that the Spanish, but also the Portuguese empires were riddled with iniquity and cruelty, that they just wantonly murdered native people in a kind of winner takes all race to exploit the new world's riches. And of course, people in colonial British America and the early U.S. after that used that image, that black legend as a kind of a foil to position themselves as more enlightened and more rational and generous and humane. But that started to change when the Spanish-American independence wars erupted, and 
especially after the War of 1812 concluded and people in the U.S. had more time to really pay attention to Latin America. And what was so striking to me was how positive they usually were. I mean, people very quickly overlooked their longstanding prejudice against Catholics and their skepticism of all things Spanish. And they celebrated these latest American revolutionaries as partners in a global struggle against European colonialism and monarchical tyranny. So then the question is, how do you explain this, this transition in views? I think part of it was that people in the U.S. seem to assume that Spanish Americans were proving themselves and redeeming Catholicism in the very act of revolution. And of course, it helped that they were fighting against the hated Spanish. But the other key part of the optimism was that people in the early U.S. had always maintained that their ideals were universal. I mean, ever since the revolution, they had said that they were fighting for humankind. And so when Latin Americans started to throw off colonial rule and move towards republicanism, people in the U.S. were very happy to take credit for it, even though, in fact, as I said, Napoleon had far more to do with it. And I should add as an aside, too, that Latin Americans were certainly ready to give the U.S. credit and to give credit to anybody who could possibly help them. So in some ways, they kind of fuel that nationalistic conceit on the part of the U.S. But the result is that people in the U.S. felt so proud to think that Latin Americans were fighting this new kind of tropical iteration of 1776, that Latin American independence actually became a major engine of U.S. nationalism in the 10 years or so after the War of 1812. So I found, for example, that more than half of July 4th parties in that decade toasted Latin American independence. So Latin American independence became a mainstay of popular U.S. nationalism. How did Spanish American countries finance their revolutions? And the reason I ask is because the Spanish American revolutions do have a fair amount in common with the American Revolution. And when the American colonies sought their independence, they turned to France, the Netherlands and Spain for loans and materiel to help them with their fight. So I wonder, did Americans in the United States feel any sort of obligation to help these new fledgling states finance their revolutions just as European nations once helped finance theirs? Some people in the United States made the rhetorical point that the U.S. should help Latin America like France had helped the United States about two generations before. But almost nobody really meant it in the sense that almost nobody was saying the U.S. should actually abandon its historic neutrality to side full speed ahead with the Latin American insurgents. So there's never any kind of formal alliance or government-sponsored aid like you had seen in the American Revolution in in the 1770s. The South Americans' biggest loans ended up coming from Britain, which was not that surprising because Britain was by far the biggest commercial powerhouse in the world. I mean, if you needed money in the early 19th century, you went to Britain. And Britain, too, had plenty of its own commercial and diplomatic reasons to support Latin America. But of course, South Americans didn't want to put all of their eggs in one basket. So they also, as I said, sent agents to the U.S., to seek aid. And so the agents would come here and they'd go to policymakers and bankers and also to newspaper editors. And they'd kind of exaggerate a little bit. And they'd say, oh, everyone in Latin America loves the United States. We want so badly to be just like you. Can you just help us along the path a little bit? And as you can imagine, U.S. audiences eat this stuff up because they love to feel important. They didn't realize that Latin American agents were also going to Britain at the same time and saying much the same thing about how much they loved Britain. I mean, before the internet, this kind of stuff wasn't so easily exposed. And so some of these rebel visitors became minor celebrities in the U.S. and they helped to fuel this dubious conceit that Latin American independence was above all inspired by 1776. But there were also concrete efforts to South Americans' attempts to get aid in the U.S. And again, this comes on the part of private citizens as opposed to the federal government. So first is that U.S. merchants became one of the rebels' main suppliers of arms and ammunition, often by working in partnership, it seems, with British merchants. Although at the end of the day, British merchants probably sold more firearms than U.S. merchants did. Second is about 3,000 privateers 
sailed from U.S. ports under insurgent Latin American flags. So these are people, in other words, who are actually taking up arms for Latin American independence. And there were also maybe a few hundred U.S. citizens who enlisted directly in South American navies. And that, too, just to give some context, is maybe a bit less than Britain. About 5,000 British subjects seem to have taken up arms for South America. It's probably in the same ballpark, though. But again, this is not a formal alliance. This is the U.S. acting as a neutral nation. And its private citizens still had certain abilities to sell weapons and trade and so forth. Caitlin, this is a fascinating story. And I have to be honest, I'm sitting here smiling about the irony of the situation. The struggles of the Spanish-American agents bring to my mind John Adams's letters home from the Netherlands and Benjamin Franklin and Silas Dean's letters home from France, all of them grumbling about how the revolutionaries were trying to convince European nations to lend them money for the revolution and lamenting about what a difficult time they were having doing it. And yet, when in a position to help, the United States didn't make it any easier for Spanish-American revolutionaries to secure similar loans. Yeah, there were about 200 South Americans who came to the U.S. in this period. And a lot of them, as I said, are these kinds of agents lobbying for aid. One of my favorite examples here is a Brazilian whose name was Antonio Gonçalves da Cruz. He came from northeastern Brazil from a province called Pernambuco. And I'll tell you the story because he ends up meeting with John Adams. So Cruz was quite a character. He came from a very wealthy family in the Brazilian province of Pernambuco. He was very affable polished, genteel. He had a big library in his mansion of a house with lots of subversive books about the French Revolution. And he was a bachelor who liked to throw these huge blowout parties in his home in Brazil. And then in 1817, he helped to orchestrate Republican uprising against the Portuguese monarchy. And this insurgent Pernambuco government sends Cruz as an agent to the U.S. to try to win support. And they tell him, go and buy weapons, get loans, see if you can get diplomatic recognition for us and so forth. But rebel leaders in Pernambuco also specifically instruct Cruz to try to win over public opinion because the way they see it, the U.S. is a republic. And so they're guessing that they're only going to be able to win federal support if voters pressure their federal and elected officials. So Cruz goes to the U.S. and he essentially launches a big PR campaign, which of course is a great assignment for him because he's such a chatty and charming guy. So he travels up and down the East Coast, meeting with newspaper editors, befriending them, maybe sometimes bribing them, using his charm to tell them just how much people in Pernambuco love the United States. And those editors, who of course love to hear just how great their country is, then proceed to print these effusive glowing news reports about Cruz and his cause. So I sampled, I think, 169 newspapers, and over 80% of them reported on Pernambuco's rebellion, even though that rebellion only lasted a few weeks before Portuguese officials put it down. And so here's where this comes back to John Adams, because Cruz meets with John Adams, who by then was an elderly man living just outside of Boston. And the context here is that just a year or two before, Adams, who is, of course, this fractious kind of personality had written characteristically caustic stuff about South Americans. He actually said that they were less prepared for democracy than the birds, beasts, or fishes. And then Cruz in 1817 pays a visit. He knocks on the former president's door. He works his magic. And he actually seems to have won over this cantankerous old president because Adams actually wrote about it to Thomas Jefferson a few days later. He said that Cruz's visit made him remember what it had felt like to be in Europe begging for aid during the American Revolution. Adams was really moved by it. And he was evidently quite impressed by Cruz and his cause. Of course, John Adams wasn't the only American inspired by the Spanish-American revolutions. These revolutions inspired many Americans. In fact, American enthusiasm for these revolutions manifested in a somewhat non-traditional way. Caitlin, would you tell us about your fascinating research into baby naming practices? Yeah, it turns out that in the early and mid-1820s, there were about 
200 sets of parents who named their sons Bolivar or Bolivar, as they variously pronounced it, after, of course, Simon Bolivar, the George Washington of South America figure that I mentioned. And you can find this in census reports. So you might think, as I originally did, that the parents involved in this Bolivar baby boom, as I like to call it, might think they were uniquely well-to-do cosmopolitans on the East Coast. But in fact, these parents lived all over the country. Most of them were rural farmers, and there were a few craftsmen and sailors and so forth. And so just to give one example, in southeastern Illinois, there was a pair of farmers named James and Barbara Nab who named their first son Bolivar and their second son Hamilton. And I so wish I could have been a fly on the wall when these sleep-deprived parents were talking about what to name their children. I mean, did the husbands propose the name or did the wives? Did they argue about it? What exactly did they admire about Simon Bolivar? I found a letter from from one young couple where the husbands wanted to name their firstborn son Jose Miguel after a Chilean general. And apparently his pregnant wife was a little reluctant, but she agreed to do it because it turns out she was a big fan of this Chilean general as well. She actually wrote a musical ode to Chile. So one interesting thing about the Bolivar baby boom as a form of evidence is that mothers were involved in it too. I should also add that although most of the baby Bolivars were white, there were a few people of color who seemed to have taken on the name Bolivar often as a last name, evidently to mark their freedom from slavery, including a baby boy in Pennsylvania who actually had the full name, Simon Bolivar. And that's especially interesting because Simon Bolivar was widely known as being something of a moderately anti-slavery figure, and African Americans were especially aware of that. And then finally, it's also kind of fun to note that this trend went beyond baby naming. So lots of farmers named their livestock Bolivar, including none other than Major General Andrew Jackson, who named named his favorite horse, Bolivar, during the 1824 election season. So you can think of it as a show of respect from one American war hero to another. And then there were boats and towns and even a style of hats named after Bolivar as well. So you name it, no pun intended, you name it, people were naming it Bolivar. Your research into baby naming practices really does reveal glimpses of the political views of early American women. I mean, I can't imagine many instances where a woman would name her baby after a revolutionary or really anyone else, for that matter, whom she didn't support and admire. And this, in part, makes your work fascinating because the political views of women during the age of coverture are often difficult to recover. One thing that's interesting that's been fun for me about this project is By looking at popular views of Latin American independence, you can sometimes get at how ordinary people thought about things like equality and revolution and republicanism. So as you're saying, you don't all that often get ordinary women, say farmers in Illinois, commenting on Latin American independence or about republicanism or about the U.S. role in the world. But if you look in census reports, you can see these farming families making these baby name choices. And in some ways that opens up more questions than we can answer, but it does offer this glimpse of these couples on farms, sometimes in places so rural that there were no town names, they're just identified in census reports by the county. And yet clearly these mothers and fathers are reading the newspapers. They're eagerly paying attention to what's happening in South America. They seem personally invested in it enough that they would name their sons after the far off Catholic Spanish speaking statesman. I know that you said that the census records reveal that people all over the United States were naming their children Baby Bolivar and after other Spanish American revolutionaries. But when you were looking at these census records, did you happen to find out whether there was one region that seemed more gun ho about these revolutions than another region? I found that people were most excited about South American independence in the West. That's where you saw, for example, the highest number of baby boulevards. People were a little less excited about it in New England, and that's partly because New England's economy was more based on trade with 
Spain and Cuba, which was still part of the Spanish Empire. New England also had less excitement because the Federalist Party's influence was historically stronger there, even after the party collapsed in the wake of the War of 1812. So just as during the French Revolution in the 1790s, Federalists in the early 19th century worried about the violence that accompanied rapid social change, and they were also a little more skeptical about Latin Americans' potential. But I say that with the caveat that few Federalists were openly hostile towards Latin America. Most of them were really just more ambivalent. They kind of just shrugged and would say, you know, essentially they'd say, good luck. You know, we're not sure you can do it, Latin America, but fine, we wish you well. It'd be nice for the world if Latin America was independent. They just didn't get so swept up in the optimistic excitement in the same way that Republicans were more likely to do. So Latin American independence wasn't as divisive as the French Revolution had been. So then Westerners, for their part, were more excited about South American independence, partly because Federalists were weaker in the West. The West also had a history of especially strong anti-Spanish sentiment. So in the early years of the U.S., Spain had tried to sever U.S. access to the Mississippi River, for example. And also there were some Westerners who thought that if Mexico in particular became independent, then it might cede more land to the United States, like Texas, for example. But I was actually surprised by how rarely people elsewhere in the country talked about that. In episode 17, we spoke with Francois Furstenberg about French influence in the early United States. And a lot of that French influence came from refugees from France, Haiti, and other places affected by the French Revolution. And I wonder, did the Spanish-American revolutions cause an influx of refugees into the United States? And if so, where did these refugees go and how did they influence American culture? There were refugees who fled from South America to the United States. I have found about 200 South Americans, and probably the biggest number of those were refugees and exiles, as opposed to agents and diplomats. Just to give some context for that, that's really nothing compared to the numbers who came from France and also from the French colony of Saint-Domingue in the 1790s and early 19th century. There were tens of thousands of them. But Latin Americans do come. The agents, as I said, because they seek newspaper publicity do make a big difference. In terms of the refugees and exiles, they're usually lower profile than the revolutionary agents like Antonio Gonçalves da Cruz, who was the one who came from Brazil. The refugees, instead of trying to recruit aid and diplomatic recognition and get weapons and so forth, refugees and exiles more often remain focused on their lives and families back at home. And honestly, a lot of them seem to feel, above all, a mixture of sad sadness and bitterness and homesickness. So one of them, I remember this letter because it seems so heartfelt. He wrote that he was half naked and sick. These are his words. And he said he was still aching from bullet wounds. So a lot of them had kind of hard, sad lives when they got here. But one of the most interesting refugees I found, and in fact, this was one of my favorite finds of the book, was a man of color named Emiliano Munduruku. And Munduruku bucks a lot of those trends that I've just described because when he arrived in the U.S., he not only settled here and made a home of it, he really tried to change it in profound ways. So Munduruku was a man of color who had helped to lead a Republican uprising in Brazil in 1824, and he actually urged the revolutionaries there to emulate Haiti. And when that revolt imploded, he slips out of Brazil in the most Brazilian of ways, which is to say that it was carnival time. So with help from a U.S. merchant in town, Munduruku puts on a mask and parades out to the harbor and boards the ship, and nobody knew it was him. So the boat, it turns out, was bound for Boston, and he goes on to become a fixture of the abolitionist community there until his death just a few months after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. So he was an early donor to the New England Anti-Slavery Society. Society, and he seems to have been the plaintiff in an early desegregation battle when his wife was denied a spot in the so-called ladies' cabin of a steamship because she wasn't white. And Munduruku also gave early abolitionists like Lydia Maria Child and her husband David ideas about how to make the case against slavery in the U.S. by using an inter-American and more global context. So he was one refugee who represented an inter-American dimension to abolition and especially to black abolitionism that historians haven't talked much about yet. 
Mundruku's involvement with the abolition movement is actually a fitting topic for our conversation, because one aspect of these revolutions that we've yet to talk about is that nearly every Spanish-American revolution sought to abolish slavery. Would you tell us about the types of slavery that were practiced in Spanish America and how these various revolutions sought to abolish these practices? Slavery in South America was chattel slavery, just like in the United States, meaning that it was people who could be bought and sold. So people owned other human beings, they owned the fruits of their labor, and they owned their children and their children's children and all of those future generations of labor. So as you said, during the age of revolution, that changes to some degree. I mean, it's not all of South America because when Brazil becomes independent, it does so as a monarchy and slavery continues right through 1888, 1889, when Brazil becomes a republic. But in mainland Spanish America, where Spanish Americans are having their independence wars, they do, in almost all cases, pass gradual anti-slavery laws during this revolutionary period. Not for the most part, because abolition is their be-all, end-all. In fact, independence from Spain is usually their main goal. And so a lot of the white leaders of Spanish-American independence end up supporting these gradual anti-slavery laws as a nod to military and political necessity. And I should emphasize that word gradual because Spanish-American slavery lasted for decades beyond the independence wars and slaveholders contested abolition tooth and nail even after these laws passed. But the independence wars were an important step. So in some ways, you could say that Spanish Americans were doing at the national level what a lot of northern states in the U.S. had done at a state level in the wake of the American Revolution by passing these gradual anti-slavery laws that would essentially say, you know, any slave born after this law takes effect would win his or her freedom at a certain age, 21 or 26 or what have you. And thousands of white Southerners in the U.S. were also talking about gradual abolition into the 1820s. So it's really interesting to see how white people in the U.S. responded to Spanish-American anti-slavery. So now we have to ask, did the fact that Spanish-Americans were working to abolish slavery during their revolutions color American views of Spanish-Americans and their willingness to support Spanish-American revolutions? Yeah, when I started this research, I was expecting that white U.S. audiences would have been pretty negative about Spanish-American anti-slavery policies, if they knew about them at all. And the main reason I imagined that was that we know that in the 1790s, during the slave revolt in Haiti, a lot of white people in the U.S. were quite horrified. So that reaction really shows the limits of how far white people in the U.S. were willing to go in sympathizing with anti-slavery foreign revolutionaries. But I found, much to my surprise, a really different reaction Spanish-American anti-slavery efforts. Editors reported very widely on anti-slavery efforts in South America, and they were surprisingly unfazed, even in the Deep South, in places like Georgia. Editors reported on anti-slavery efforts in especially Colombia and Venezuela. And then in the next breath, they would say, essentially, we wish them well, and whatever they have to do to end Spanish rule is okay with us. I mean, I was shocked by these responses. Just to put a human face on it, for one example, there's a South Carolina editor named William Langley who lived in a town that had recently, in the last month or two, I think, been rocked by an alleged slave conspiracy. The town had just hanged five black men as guilty. And Langley, who had personally heard the accused slave's testimony because he was a town councilman as well as a newspaper editor, he reported on Simon Bolivar's anti-slavery efforts in his newspaper. And then he actually says, we wish him all the success the cause of liberty deserves. So he's on Bolivar's side, even though he knows that Bolivar is supporting gradual abolition. So what's happening here, right? Why were white slaveholders in places like South Carolina so nonchalant and sometimes even optimistic about Spanish-American independence and the anti-slavery that so often came along with it? Why were their reactions so different from reactions to Haiti? Well, first, they knew that Spanish-American anti-slavery was pretty gradual, right? that it's not coming on the heels of a slave rebellion like it had in Haiti. So if Haiti was at the more radical end of the anti-slavery spectrum, 
spectrum. And if the U.S., which had a rapidly growing slave population, was at the other end of that spectrum, then Spanish America was kind of in the middle. And white people in the U.S. were by and large comfortable with Spanish Americans' middle position on that spectrum. And then the second key reason for white people's nonchalance here was that they knew that Spanish America was generally further away than Haiti was. So it seemed more like a benign abstraction and less of a real security threat to Southern planters. But then underlying all of that third was the apparent understanding that ending slavery was an understandable and rational and maybe even honorable thing for good Republicans to do under certain circumstances. So these Southern editors didn't think that slavery should be ended any time soon in the United States, but at the same time, they could still support places that were slowly ending slavery abroad as part of a bigger effort against European colonialism. So one of my biggest takeaways from this research was that the popular enthusiasm for Spanish American independence, anti-slavery and all, shows at some level the persistence of the universalist egalitarian ideals of 1776. Obviously, there were very stark limits to that egalitarian thinking. But what struck me was that when white people in the U.S. talked about what made their country great, they talked about how their Republican ideals were spreading around the world, including to Spanish-speaking, anti-slavery Catholics of color. It's time for the Time Warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if the French Revolution had not taken place and Napoleon hadn't come into power? Would the revolutions in Spanish America have still happened? And if they hadn't happened, what would have brought an end to slavery in Spanish America? Well, I feel like I should probably leave most of that question to the Latin Americanist, but I will just say that if there was no French Revolution and no Napoleon, then no, I don't think Spanish American or Brazilian independence would have happened when they did. Instead, I suspect you might have seen people pushing for imperial reform rather than full-fledged independence and Republican revolution. And when it comes to slavery, I suspect that slavery would probably have lasted longer on the Spanish American mainland. But maybe counterbalancing that is that if there was no French Revolution, there probably wouldn't have been a Haitian Revolution, at least at that moment. The Haitian Revolution had wiped out slavery in Haiti, but it also sparked new sugar producers and therefore a rise in slavery in places like Cuba, which now rushed in to fill the sugar market and sugar production. So if there was no French Revolution and no Haitian Revolution, slavery might have lasted longer in mainland Spanish America, but at the same time, it may not have skyrocketed so quickly in Cuba and also Puerto Rico. So as with all counterfactuals, it's hard to say. Especially a counterfactual as big as the one I just asked you. (laughs) Now that you've covered the age of American revolutions, where is your hemispheric interest in early American history taking you next? Well, I'm working on a few projects, but one of them is actually to trace out the story of this Brazilian refugee I mentioned, Emiliano Mundruku, who is that revolutionary of color who fled to Boston and ended up becoming an important part of Boston's abolitionist community, because I think there's a lot more to say about him than I was able to say in my book. And where on the Internet will we find more information about you, your work and how we can contact you if we have questions about the age of American revolutions? If you just Google my name, you can find my page on the Northwestern University History Department website, and that has my contact info and more about my work as well. Thank you for spending time with us today, Caitlin Fitz. We really enjoyed learning more about the age of American revolutions and how Americans reacted to the revolutions in Spanish America. My pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Like Caitlin, I'm a bit surprised that Americans in the United States reacted so positively to Latin and South American revolutions. On the one hand, it makes sense that Americans wanted to believe that their revolution and movement to form an independent nation had inspired other colonies in the Western Hemisphere to do the same. After all, a hemisphere without European influence promised to make all American lives a bit easier 
in terms of starting an inter-American trade. Plus, a European void seemed like it would put the United States in a place of influence in these new independent nations. Or so Americans in the United States hopefully thought it would. On the other hand, Latin and South Americans declared the abolition of slavery as part of their revolutionary goals. Their movement to end slavery may have been slow and very gradual, as Caitlin pointed out, but it represented a move that many in the United States were not yet prepared to make in the early or even in the mid 19th century. If you'd like to discover more about Caitlin, her book, Our Sister Republics, plus notes for what we talked about today, you should visit the show notes page benfranklinsworld.com slash zero nine zero. Don't forget the book giveaway in August. If you'd like to participate, be sure to join the Ben Franklin's World listener community on Facebook. You can join by clicking the orange join now button on the benfranklinsworld.com homepage or by texting BF World to 33444. Finally, what do you think of the baby Bolivar movement? Can you think of other famous revolutionaries or political and cultural leaders that have affected the way we name our children? Send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page for this episode or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.